This is take two, actually. <laughs> so we, uh, I spoke to myself there for about five minutes. So if you can hear me and see me, I love it when you give me a thumbs up and tell me where you're from. I'm Dr. Boz, and we are live on Sunday night here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I have a really great show for you tonight, and I am uh, excited to see if it hits the audience. Uh, each week when I try to think of... Uh, the content that I'm uh, preparing for, some of the talks I am working towards over many weeks, and other times there will be a question that a patient asks me, and in response to their answer, I just imagine how I could have taught them better if I would have had a few slides or a little more time. So um, the uh, process of teaching um, uh, patients about their endocrine system, which is what we're going to focus on tonight, uh, is not just a quick tagline. I really want to explain what it is that I'm thinking and why I get so uh, adamant about um, really pushing patients back to several of these videos. Um, many of you have been the uh, the inspiration for several of these videos as you write into the channel or if you're my patient and you've asked a question that I don't have a video on, I, I will use these videos as a way to bridge the education that I want my patients to have. So I'll often send them to a video, I'll say, on this date, I recorded the video, go watch that live. Uh, and I've learned, wow, what an, a transformation for patients to have a place to hear what I wish would have fit into a time warp so they could have heard me say it a two or three times. Nothing like YouTube to help uh, promote that education. And in the spirit of uh, finding uh, topics that hit my audience, I actually like these the best where um, I was actually editing slides right up to the last minute to see, can I explain this in a way that really does um, hit the... <clears throat> Somebody says there's an echo. Uh, if you're f hearing an echo, let me know. Um, it looks good. Okay. So <clears throat> the, um, the process of explaining these videos uh, or these concepts, uh, I do it hundreds of, hundreds of times. But to put it in a video with some slides like we're going to do today, um, I, I really do think... I'm going to turn this one down and see if that helps. Uh, some of no echo some of them say all right we'll see how this works out <clears throat> so if you can still hear me give me a thumbs up if uh, otherwise other most of you say that there's not an echo all right so um tonight's topic is going to be um how do you explain the endocrine system of insulin and why is it such an important process for helping to explain to patients it's this hidden hormonal um, signal that's going on behind your um, behind your brain, behind the way your cells divide, behind the way your body cleans up uh, this process um, that I, I really do think uh, once patients understand why I push them to document what's going on, um, I can make a pretty good educated guess as what's going on, but when a patient understands what's going on, they change behavior. And that is how you stay out of my clinic. <laughs> That's how you graduate from being, uh, uh, having to see the physician. So I'm going to start like I do most of my uh, weeks. We're going to start by checking my numbers. And I will tell you that I uh, had a recent conversation with my mother uh, for many of you around know that my mom is Grandma Rose, and she is now 76, recently widowed as we buried Dad this past few months, uh, actually about eight weeks ago now, uh, seven weeks ago now. And we, is it seven weeks ago? Yeah. Yeah, too soon. Um, the... Uh, She's had just a lot of stress, and if those of you that have followed the channel for a while know that I wrote the book Any Way You Can when she, um, the story started when she turned 71, and she had had cancer for 10 years. Her cancer was of the white blood cells, and the book walks her through, walks you through her journey of the ketogenic diet. So here is my ketones, uh, and I use, people see me use two meters, but it really it's the exact same meter, I just try to do it for 
uh, simplicity stake on the uh, on the channel. So you can see the purple one is the ketones 1.8 and the glucose is 87. So we're going to take that Dr. Boz ratio, which I've learned not to do math on live <laughs> YouTube, but we will also check it at the end of the uh, show. Um, Grandma Rose uh, has her oncology follow up this next week, and um, she has you know, a big moment coming her way. Uh, she's had a lot of stress with the death of my dad and the, his failing health over the last six months has been very hard on her. But um, we got a sneak peek at her labs, which s her cancer isn't growing. Um, it, I mean, it's really good numbers for her, which is amazing. Um, but there is a little hint that she's getting some scar tissue inside her bone marrow. So I've asked her to start fasting um, again, and if you read the story, you know that she is, um, thank you for doing that, uh, Dr. Ball's ratio, Bethany. I appreciate that. My Dr. Ball's ratio is 48. <laughs> um, but if you look at, uh, what we're going to do with Grandma Rose, I'm asking her to push her endocrine system in hopes to melt off some of her, uh, scar tissue inside her bone marrow. Again, we don't, uh, know how this works in a 76 year old with She's had chronic le leukemia now for almost, um, are we at 16 years? Um, and she's the healthiest she's ever been, but we have some work to do. I'm going to tell you more about that as we go on. I do want to show you, this is uh, what is new on the market now, which is ketones in a can, uh, but it's chocolate flavor. And I, um, I usually try to do some sort of... Uh, teachable moment while I'm on the show and just give you full transparency that I'm just putting this in water. And um, this is brand new on Amazon. I think it's only been there for a week. But again, once one of the <clears throat> setbacks that I had in this journey of how do you help patients along the way with a ketogenic journey has been when they have severe problems uh, with their metabolism, with getting keto adapted. Grandma Rose had me, but many people don't have that, you know, close access to a physician that is really um, passionate or almost a geek about how does a ketogenic chemistry alter her body? How does it improve her autophagy? And using supplements isn't my favorite thing, but it is amazing how many patients it has helped get out of the ditch, really out of that foggy brain and transition into um, this keto adapted brain power and keto, um, uh, keto chemistry. We're going to talk about that tonight, um, but if you haven't been to the, uh, there's only, I only made 500 of these uh, packets, so I just, uh, if you want to try the chocolate, I think it's my best flavor yet. And again, I started making supplements because I would test my uh, numbers after spending a pretty good chunk of change on supplements of ketones in a can or exogenous ketones. And I could not see improvements in the patients uh, circulating ketones. More importantly, um, I couldn't see it in mine either. <laughs> so not more importantly, but just as importantly. So finally, I said, okay, we're going to have a, 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 a exogenous ketones with as few additives as possible. And we are going to try to make it taste pretty good. <laughs> so again, uh, ketones in uh, the chocolate flavor is out and... I've had some pretty good reviews for that, so I'm thankful for that. Hmm. I have a couple of other announcements that I, there are 31 chapters in the book uh, that's coming out that I have written. It is the second book. Uh, I, you know, there's lots of keto books out there. Why would I need to write another book? Um, and what I've learned since the story I've written about Grandma Rose is that there is a very methodical process about how to take patients from a chronically inflamed situation, uh, you know, a, a, a good old internal medicine patient with 15 medications and just as many medical problems on their list, how can you transition them into a life that doesn't need the physician or very rarely needs the physician? And the number of prescriptions are um, as, uh, has, have gone down <laughs> almost as fast as they've gone down as when they first started seeing me. I have a personal goal of stopping as many prescriptions in the next 20 years of my practice as I started in the first 20 years. I do believe that you need this methodical process of how do you walk through the keto adaption. And again, what, what 
what do I do in my clinic? What do I do with the patients that I see? And what is that process for um, you to be able to walk with your physician at, in a journey that reduces inflammation, decreases the, the grime of your endocrine system over time, and improves your autophagy, increases your telomere length, uh, really, uh, really restores life. Uh, on the Dr. Boss channel, we say ketones for life, and that really means that I will produce ketones until I'm in the grave, but it also means that to restore life to the chronic inflamed patient, uh, there is a process, and it is uh, something that I do in a very methodical way in my clinic, but also in my support group. Um, I find that most pati patients don't need to see a physician to do this. They just need the rules. So in the past week, I have finally finished uh, chapter 30. Chapter 31 is the summary of a patient that I walked through in the story, and you can hear his struggles and what he, uh, what he goes through, but you'll, you're also learning about why are you doing this and why am I asking him to do these things. And in that same um, process, there will be a workbook for you to journey through your own keto continuum in hopes that you can inspire your physician to do it with you, or if nothing else, uh, self-education through YouTube, or um, hopefully your physician helps you as well. All right, so um, today's topic is um, the, the, the endocrine system is part of the human body that is um, not as easy to explain, uh, but it is paramount in its importance. Uh, when endocrine uh, is the part of your system where a message gets sent from one area of your body to the other, and there's no wire connecting them, there's no signal. It is that that communication happens through hormones or through proteins in throughout your body. Uh, Producing those proteins and delivering those proteins are a reflection of health. Uh, when we look at my chronically inflamed patients, they make a very low amount of hormones. Uh, they don't peak and valley with their hormones like uh, healthy patients do. And I contend that the stronger a patient gets in their health, the better their sharp curve up and sharp uh, slope down for when a hormone is needed to communicate a message and then settling back down. So we're gonna start by um, pushing, uh, let's see here, I'm gonna push play, and uh, let's see here. Let's see here. Um, there we go. <laughs> That's what I wanted it to do. Okay, so now I'm going to push keynotes um, let's see if that, okay. Oh, got it. All right. Sorry. All right. Sorry. Here we are. Um, I have done some of this before, so I'm going to start with some of the information that I think you've learned in the past, and we are going to build upon that. So again, when you eat food, um, there is the, uh, first, um, um, discovery that your body has eaten when the food lands in your stomach. Uh, actually, even in your mouth, the secretion of saliva can uh, often stimulate some of the endocrine system to begin working. Uh, but when we talk about um, the endocrine system having a, um, let's see, how do I make that go? There we go. When we talk about the endocrine system having its signals, one of the, uh, the way your endocrine system works and often is a something in the body happens and then there is a response from your system. When we look at the energy found in your body, that's what this chart is uh, uh, reflecting, is that when glucose, uh, when we eat uh, glucose, so those, those uh, squares on this channel are reflective of carbohydrates, uh, the energy goes up rather quickly, and then it uh, it falls down rather quickly. So uh, two to three hours of energy is what we get when you eat carbohydrates. Um, when you look at the insulin behind that, we're going to talk very uh, carefully about that today, is how high does the insulin go? How, high, how long did it stay elevated? And what was that endocrine process um, happening behind those closed doors, uh, or at least behind the cell walls inside your system? 
Um, we know that when we look at ketones uh, in a standard American diet, uh, most of us, most standard American uh, uh, menus do not allow for much ketone production. It is only after that glucose has fallen, and you can just kind of see the shadows of those glucose on that slide, that the the energy from those from the glucose has to go down, the insulin has to slip down, and over uh, as the energy starts to fall from glucose, your body will make ketones. Uh, when I look at ketones um, in someone's circulation, today you saw that I had 1.8 ketones in circulation. This is a uh, this is part of um, the the almost mystery that when people go on the ketogenic diet, I tell everybody that comes to the support group and hopefully everybody that watches these videos that being on a ketogenic diet isn't about what you eat, it's about what's in your chemistry. It's not an accident that I check my numbers at the beginning and hopefully at the end of every show. I'm trying to show you that uh, to be in a state of ketosis, to reap the benefits that Grandma Rose had when she was fighting cancer at 71, and that she's going to, again, start uh, escalating up because of some of her health, um, just giving us a little wrinkle of uh, complications. We're going to invoke what ketosis and autophagy can do to her system by manipulating her endocrine system. And standard American menus do not usually leave enough time in between meals, uh, and they usually are flooded with carbohydrates going into a body that's already inflamed or overweight. As you look through today, we're going to show you a study that looks at healthy people, and then I'm going to try and reflect what that would look like in someone who is uh, inflamed, uh, overweight, or fighting cancer like Grandma Rose. Um, all right, so I will point out that the uh, uh, if you look at the show notes from here, you'll also you'll be able to copy the link to take you to the study. This was done in 2008, and it's really important for you as you watch these numbers to say, well, who were we studying? And these folks were from Seattle. They were healthy. They couldn't be on a diet, and they couldn't be pregnant to be part of the study. And their body mass index uh, had to be 30 or less. That means they couldn't be overweight. Not just we didn't have obese patients, they had to be healthy weight in order to be in the study. So if you look at one of the best predictors of insulin resistance, I can have you save a, a bunch of money to say, are you insulin resistant? When it's still, one of the best predictors, and this has gone through several regimes, not the study I just quoted or the one that's in the show notes, but several regimes to say, how can we measure insulin resistance? What's the best predictor? And body mass index still measures it the best. If you are greater than 30 on a body mass index, that measures your height and your weight and calculates out uh, what, it, what are your numbers. Um, if your body mass index is greater than 30, the chances that you are insulin resistant are high. So the study we're about to look at is um, not the one that we are, um, I mean, you could not be included if you were overweight. Let's also see if I can do here and here and here we go. Let's see, this is what I wanted to do. There we go. Um, all right, so uh, this uh, next part looks at um, the insulin, and when you measure insulin, uh, insulin is one of our endocrine hormones, and uh, insulin has, it's never zero. Uh, usually when it's 20 or 40 or 60, um, those are inflamed levels of insulin. Uh, we're looking here at the peak amount of insulin. When people come in fasting uh, and we check to see what is their insulin level at? If I had all the money in the world, I had the most perfect uh, laboratory, and I had an equation that, uh, or a team that could uh, take out all of the variables that affect insulin, and it's a lot of variables, um, we would want a fasting insulin to be somewhere around five. Uh, this means they haven't had food in over 16 hours. The higher the insulin spikes, um, you really do find a destruction of cells, the higher that insulin spikes. Uh, many times I get patients coming in, they know that insulin is really tough on their system, and they'll ask me to measure their insulin. I will tell them, nope, you don't want to do that. We could spend 
we could spend ten thousand dollars studying your insulin, and we still wouldn't have a, a really good understanding of that um, for the most part. Insulin is an endocrine system, and it is um, what is at what is the insulin at a level where you haven't stimulated the body or sparked the body, where you haven't sent a signal uh, to your system, and then what is the insulin level after you've really exhausted the system? And that takes several measurements. Uh, insulin is at least 75 bucks a pop. If I study it in most patients, I'm going to get at least six measurements of before the meal and then several times after the meal. And then we want we want their life perfect when we check it because uh, it, there's so many things that screw up. I actually do not recommend you check your insulin. I think it's a waste of money. Uh, I think there's other ways to understand what's going on in your system. But for research purposes, I think this study does a great job. So here we have insulin along the side. Again, we don't like it to spike high. We don't like it to stay high very long. And here were the measurements of time along the bottom. There was, you know, 10 minutes before they ate. There was right at the moment when they started eating. And then they get 20 minutes after the meal, 40, 60, 80, all the way up uh, to uh, several hours after the, uh, six hours after the, the meal. So watching this, we're going to start by looking at what happened when the patients ate carbohydrates, what happened when they ate protein, and what happened when they ate fat. So let's start with taking a close notice that at time zero is when they eat, and then we're going to see what happens next. All right, so let's begin with a carbohydrate meal. Uh, again, this is what most of my patients come in eating, and when they have the carbs go in, uh, you will find that their insulin, again, insulin being the hormone, rises very high within about 40 minutes um, of that, um, that eating. As you look at time over that two, three, um, four hours later, it takes al almost you know, uh, 280 minutes uh, to get uh, to get that insulin really back to where it belongs um, in in the process, so you say it's still not back to what it was before they started. It wasn't below twenty, even six hours later. Um, you will find the insulin is probably double from what it was. These patients then fasted all day long, uh, all night long, and the next morning they were given another meal. But while they were studying the insulin, they also looked at several other things. They looked at their triglycerides, they looked at their glucose, they looked at something called ghrelin. Ghrelin is a signal to say, can I eat? And that stimulus for hunger is very much related to how high did their insulin peak. So when people say, why is it that people lose weight on the ketogenic diet? Um, or I have them come to group saying, I'm on, this, I'm on the ketogenic diet because I want to lose weight. Well, I'm doing everything you say. Why am I not losing weight? Uh, and part of that is, have you shut down that drive to want food? So here's, a, here's the carbohydrate meal at zero, at time zero. Six hours later, it's still not back down to its baseline. Uh, and boy, oh boy, did it spike really high uh, in that process. What is interesting is uh, how much those inflamed uh, uh, components of insulin were like four times as high as I'd want them to be in anybody with inflammation. If you, if you come to me and you have coronavirus or you have um, cancer like Grandma Rose, if you ha and again, her cancer is a very small. People write in all the time saying how's her cancer. I mean, she had a whopper of a mess when she was 71. A ketogenic diet really did reverse it. She's been off chemo, off, uh, and her cancer numbers have been very low um, for several, almost a year and a half now, without chemotherapy, just on a ketogenic diet. Uh, so the complication she's running into is some scar tissue allowing room for her red blood cells and her platelets, which are also in her bone marrow. So we'll hear more about what we're going to have Grandma Rose do here in a bit. Um, so as we look at uh, the other thing that I like to show patients uh, when it comes to measuring their insulin, people come in and ask for that all the time, but what I think is powerful is when they only measure their, uh, when they start to measure their glucose. So again, glucose is never zero, but um, these healthy patients, uh, if you look at this study from Seattle in 2008, they started their, their uh, fasting glucose at a, as low as 70. 
<laughs> which I think is interesting because um, a, a truly fasted state where you have all of your stored glucose spent, you've got your glycogen empty, is 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 always measured in your 60s. 65 is the average, but it's plus or minus a five from 65. So between 60 and 70 is what we would say you are truly empty of your stored and rapid spending glucose. Um, and I push patients, I'm going to push Grandma Rose to do that here in, um, at the end of this uh, podcast. Okay, so glucose, uh, carbs uh, eaten again, zero. And watch what happens to these people's glucose. Again, uh, these little uh, squares in my show are supposed to represent glucose, but man, oh man, by 40 minutes, they shot that glucose way up to 140. These are healthy lean patients. Their insulin works normal. As the glucose uh, trails out for over six hours, it does get back under 100, which is healthy. And looking only at their carbohydrates, excuse me, looking only at their blood glucose, you would never actually realize how much insulin it took, how much of that secret endocrine process was percolating throughout their body to keep those sugars controlled. When I have patients come in and they say, yeah, I check my blood sugar, the blood test says it was only 105. And in, in my clinic, I say that's an alarm signal. You should not have 105 as your glucose. That means you've had weeks and weeks and weeks of an elevated insulin. And what does that elevated insulin do? It ages you. It destroys mitochondria. It weakens your immune system. It wilts your brain, decreases your mood, uh, and robs you from a bunch of energy. So if you look at those glucoses along that, uh, when they're in the 120s and 130s, I have them all sleeping because you get your glucose that high and your brain does want to shut off. When you ask uh, you know, folks, why is a two o'clock nap so routine across the world? And it's because across the world for lunch, they have a bunch of carbs. If you want to skip that afternoon low, stop that sugar from spiking so high, uh, and it's not all the sugar's fault. Glucose is the signal for what was happening with their insulin. So if I uh, kind of just put the, the, the glucose on mute there, just kind of dampen it a little, and then pull back in the insulin and lay it over top of that uh, glucose. Again, these are the folks, lean, healthy people. And they made a bucket of insulin because they had so much glucose in their system when they ate only carbohydrates. Uh, as you study them over the, you know, several three, four, five hours, uh, their, their glucose did get lower, their insulin did come down. But when I have patients of chronic uh, overweight, they've, they've carried that extra 10, 15, 20 pounds for 10 years. I have patients coming in at 350 pounds. They've been 100 pounds overweight for a decade. And as they kind of struggle between, can I use of the ketogenic diet to get this weight off, or should I go have a surgeon cut out part of my system? I, I, I implore them to say, put yourself in a state of ketosis, give me six months. Uh, if you don't have reversal of 90% of the problems, um, you know, I, I have not lost one person to go have surgery when they've spent six months in ketosis. And you get to keep the 50 grand. <laughs> I mean, that's your money. That, that's what it costs for these patients to go through this severely um, um, life-altering surgery to lose weight. In the process of why am I so adamant about them lowering their insulin is uh, lowering their glucose and lowering their insulin is because of the hidden secrets that happen when your endocrine system surges over uh, over and above what it's supposed to, and then it never gets to come down. Notice in this patient, these are lean patients, that glucose and insulin went up. I mean, the glucose went up, but the insulin, which is your endocrine system, spiked and then it went down. Now, I think it's remarkable that it still takes that long for the insulin to go down, um, but uh, it did actually go down. Many of my patients, uh, they will eat long before that six hours is up. Uh, they, are, they are adding insulin on top of their last dose of insulin. And that's how they show up in my clinic at the age of 40 saying, ah, my blood sugar is only 105. It's not that bad. That's not diabetic. And I'm saying their endocrine system is working against them. It's aging them faster. It's why their brain isn't working correctly. It's why infections are robbing um, them from the vibrance of their life. So let's compare, again, these healthy patients to what happens when they eat protein. 
So their protein, or if we're gonna first just look what, what happened to their glucose when they were eating protein. So notice that uh, this meal, again, they'd fasted the day before, they'd fasted since their previous meal 24 hours ago. So they are now at 90, a blood sugar of 90. In my clinic, I would call that too high. I don't want your blood sugar to be even 90. I want it morning fasting blood sugars to be in that um, 70 to 80 range. Even in the 60s is okay if you've got a good supply of ketones, if you're keto adapted. These patients all were in the 85 to 95 range. So some of them would have made the cut in my clinic, but many of them, uh, you know, it's a range. So they would have, but they're healthy. They have no, no worries. Patients coming into my clinic, when you look at their fasting numbers, often at the 110, 120, 130 range. And it just means we've had a decade of overusing, oversupplying insulin. So as you see the protein uh, response, um, it does allow their system. Again, I, I want, I, people ask me all the time, do you, well, you know, why don't you promote more protein in your, uh, in your um, ketogenic diet? And it is because the process of eating protein doesn't fuel the system and really doesn't change the endocrine system nearly as much as I want it to. Uh, you'll see the, uh, the answer to that when I look closely at the insulin. So again, time zero is when they ate the protein. Um, and when you look at their insulin, uh, it did spike up to not nearly as high as what happened with the, uh, with the folks that had carbohydrate, I mean, with the meal that was carbohydrates. These are all the same patients, actually. Um, uh, but by 40 minutes, we had a spike of insulin. And we had uh, over six hours later, still not back down to what it was uh, at the beginning of that meal. So I think it's powerful for patients to see. Uh, I know you're eating all the right things. I know that uh, that meal uh, feels good to you. Um, but if you're looking for the best outcomes, uh, once your body is keto adapted, we have some other additional rules. And it's because of the secrets that go on behind the endocrine system that we ask them to do this. So now finally, let's look at what happens when they eat fat. So again, time zero, we're gonna first look at the glucose. Again, they're eating a bunch of heavy whipping cream and butter. Um, um, but wow, look at that. Their glucose looks almost exactly like it did with the protein. This is really the, the system emptying some of their stored glucose. My patients would be uh, scolded a little bit for such high blood sugars in the morning. 90 isn't what we want. It is usually much better than where we've been. So scolded isn't probably the right word, but looking at the improvements for getting that blood sugar into that place where I know their liver is finally empty of that glycogen or the stored sugar. So morning fasting glucose for these healthy patients, uh, lean patients, uh, not on a diet, just eating their normal life and not pregnant. Wow, I think it's impressive that their, their blood sugar was 90. But look at how much insulin it took um, to keep that, keep that um, uh, glucose controlled. All right, so, hmm. hang tight, there we go. So as you look, that insulin did spike up at about 40 and 60 minutes after eating all fat. When my patients come in and they say, you know, doc, I have been following the rules. I have been eating all fat. I'm on a ketogenic diet. I produce ketones. Why am I not losing weight? And they will have four or five meals of heavy fat. It'll be a little fat bomb at three o'clock. It'll be a few high fat macadamia nuts at seven o'clock at night. But they have several meals that stimulated their endocrine system. And from that, this secret life of insulin takes over and locks down their storage. These patients were healthy. They were healthy. Now, I do think it's great to see that for the first, the, the, that the fat stimulus of insulin did result in um, insulin back to its baseline by the six hours. But who, who eats uh, only every six hours when you're, um, when you're living a non-ketogenic journey, right? So as you look at what the glucose did and you look at what those, the insulin did for the fat, clearly the least amount of insulin, the least tax on the body was when there was predominantly fat. Um, I think I have, uh, yeah, just the let, this next. Um, so if we lay what happened with the protein, this is again, all the insulin res results. So the gold ones were the insulin. And then of course that red one is what happened with carbohydrates. The spike of how much insulin taxed their system 
uh, during the ketogenic uh, or during the meals, and these were healthy patients. If you look at the patients who are overweight, who've been overweight for many years, when we measure their insulins, I never get a 20. I get them starting out the day with 60 um, micro units uh, per milliliter of insulin. Uh, and that is every fat cell is locked down, every, um, every liver cell is locked down, their endocrine system is fighting against them to say, I am not gonna release any energy. We have so much stored glucose to use up that until you use up some of the stored glucose, I'm not going to unlock, unlock the storage of these other cells. Uh, which is why at the beginning of a ketogenic diet, well, I do a really good job of outlining this in my book and also in the online course. You can see that in the show notes below. But when you look at the dangers that I see patients use in a ketogenic journey, they start out very insulin resistant. They're the folks who say, if I don't lose 100 pounds, I'm going to end up in, with some bariatric surgery. And then I tell them, I need you to eat as much fat as possible. I need you to eat as many times a day as you feel like. And they're like, what? This is not a weight loss program. But what I'm doing is I'm trying to correct this chemistry. I'm trying to take, I guess it's this way, I'm trying to take those, uh, uh, those lines of high insulin and pull down, claw them down. So the stimulus uh, for producing insulin, yes, Eating does that. In these healthy patients, you can see that even eating fat does that. But in an insulin-resistant patient, there are over 10 times the amount of insulin made. Uh, and to reverse that starts with, I have to change the food that you're eating. We need to stop those carbohydrates. It needs to be 20 total carbohydrates or less per day. That's not net carbs. That's total carbs. And what am I doing? I am playing a game with their endocrine system. As I look at how many patients uh, really struggle with that that first couple of weeks, they just can't seem to get their mind around, what do you mean I, just, I really want, I really crave my carbohydrates? And I'm telling them, deep inside your system, there is an, a, a spirit of your endocrine. And it is overworked, it is overproducing insulin, and it is packing on the energy layers. And what that does to your brain, what that does to your aging, what that does to your mind uh, is something that we can reverse, but I have to take control of the endocrine system. So as many of you have read the book, uh, anyway you can, I put Grandma Rose, and actually it's when I first, uh, I'd been on a few weeks of the ketogenic diet, but I probably got a lot more hardcore when Grandma started, when my mom started doing it. So we spent six weeks and I said, I don't want you to look at a, a stinking calorie. The only thing I want you counting is carbs. And what we were doing was we were trying to raise the fat level in hopes to resurrect several of her fat-based hormones, of which were dismal. Uh, I mean, she was in zombie mode as far as brain function went and her immune system had had she had antibiotics 50 out of the 52 weeks before we started the ketogenic journey. At the end of six weeks, she was on no antibiotics. She didn't need antibiotics again for about three months. And what was happening deep inside her system is we were trying to stimulate less insulin production. That's why 20 total carbohydrates or less is absolutely the beginning of what you need to do. And it needs to be there long enough to get your fat-based hormones resurrected. How do you know if those fat-based hormones are resurrected? That's where uh, another part of your endocrine system uh, comes in, and that is the Dr. Boz ratio. So again, I didn't really come up with this language. I just was trying to help my mom. Uh, and what we were trying to measure is we didn't have $10,000 every other week to check her insulin levels. We were measuring the two molecules that insulin predicts, and that is her glucose molecule and her ketones. And if both of them, uh, if, if her glucose was high, almost always her ketones were low. And that is a sign of being a standard American diet. They don't make many ketones, their body's not ready to make ketones, and they eat wrong for that. They have way too much insulin to make that. And as you lower the carbohydrates, the glucose will lower, and you'll start to see that uh, the ketones rise. And you don't need to take my word for it. You can measure this in yourself. Again, it would take me at least six hours of time following the numbers of glucose, ketones, insulin. Um, I would measure a few other things during that protocol too. If I had all the money and all the time in the world, uh, I would study you for a few days to say this is exactly where your endocrine system is at. 
here's what we need to do. But that's ridiculous. We do not need uh, patients to do that when they have access to their own drip of blood at home, checking, I mean, Grandma Rose and I didn't check blood, check, blood numbers for, for several months. And again, I, 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 people say, would you still do that today? And um, we were in a life or death situation. I mean, she really was done with chemo and was not going to try any further. Um, but overwhelming a patient is very real. I mean, when life goes wrong, you push too hard on somebody trying to change something and they can crumble. So checking her urine ketone strips is all we cared about those first six weeks. Um, but was would I now have her check her blood sugars? I don't know. It's, I, I don't have patients do that, but I might have my mom do it. And the reason why is you can calculate exactly when they become keto adapted. And it's when the strong supply of ketones rises out of the ditch and it's when that glucose comes down. Almost always the Dr. Boz ratio is under 100 most days when they are firmly keto adapted. Now this can be a little different in patients who have been on insulin injections or insulin resistant. So we can see just a 50% drop in their Dr. Boz ratio, meaning it's been 350, 400, and now their Dr. Boz ratio is somewhere between you know, 120 and 140 or 120 and 160. That 50% reduction in the Dr. Boz ratio says we have made a huge shift in the right direction of their endocrine system. Because the other part that happens when I'm lowering the Dr. Boz ratio, it means I'm lowering the insulin. And as I lower insulin, these other fat-based hormones, uh, some of which are suppressing your hunger, raising your sex drive, increasing the way your brain functions, that, that whole vigor, that whole life-filled hormone-based process is when your Dr. Boz ratio is lower. So I have a, a star patient of mine, uh, uh, Patrick V, who I, again, met on the, he was a fan of the show, and he became a patient, and he helped me create, or he actually, he created, and we, we helped spread this uh, tool to anybody that wants it, it, which is a spreadsheet, so that this calculation is something mom, my mother, couldn't do. She was too sick, um, but as I study People like Patrick V, people that are in my clinic, they have to, have to be keeping track of their blood sugars and their blood ketones. And those calculations of the Dr. Boz ratio help me to see where is their insulin system? What is the, uh, what is the setup for uh, calculating their success? And part of measuring this surge and valley of their system is how well can we get their Dr. Boz ratio down? How low can we get their insulin? And can we return it to what would be a normal level? So knowing that you know, insulin, um, actually, well, I'm not going to do that one. Uh, let's go back over here. When, when I look at the dangers of um, an endocrine system that isn't working right, um, many times patients don't know. It's like that frog in the boiling water. The water just got worse a little bit uh, after a little bit, after a little bit, and they can't see that their, their system is so filled with inflammation and grime. And as much as I will say, you are inflamed, you have this chronic illness, uh, I can write you prescriptions until you're broke or dead, but if we want to reverse the process <clears throat> of what your system is doing, the grime that's building up inside you, um, we must lower the insulin, we must lower that Dr. Boz ratio. So there's a few freebies that I really promote that I don't care if you use them on your own or if you show your physician. One of them is that spreadsheet, the Dr. Boz spreadsheet. That is a powerful tool that I won't see a patient uh, who doesn't keep track of that. Um, it's really such an integral part of them understanding why I'm going to say we really need to put you on a different uh, protocol or a different way of um, managing your um, your endocrine system. I mean, just like when um, when I had uh, a patient come in who says, you know, Dr. Boz, I am new to the ketogenic diet. This happened this past week in my clinic. Uh, or Actually, it was in the support group that it happened. And she's like, I, I really want this weight loss. I've been doing the ketogenic diet for six weeks, and I see all of you out here fasting, and I think I'm ready for a 72-hour fast. And I was like, what are you doing? 
<laughs> you are, you know, she was probably in her mid 60s. And, and that process of asking her endocrine system to really surge and support a stress like a 72 hour fast was something that I know very well that she is not ready for that. And, and I can prove it if she was keeping track of her Dr. Boz ratio. When that Dr. Boz ratio gets down into the 40s, or she can even, you know, if you can get below 40, uh, that gives me a pretty good signal that your uh, system has uh, decreased its insulin, decreased some of the inflammation, and the supply of these hormones, which are built from fat, are now available to your system. And that surge and fall of a hormone is what's going to support you when I stress your system with a 72-hour fast or a 48-hour fast. Um, I look at um, the Dr. Boz ratio uh, as one of the ways we, mar we measure autophagy. Um, so let's back up just a second. So we take the folks who are want to lose, who are in the clinic with 350 pounds. They need to lose 100 pounds in order to stay away from the gastric bypass. So we put them on heavy, heavy, heavy fat, uh, low, less than 20 carbohydrates a day. As their carbohydrates stay under 20 and they continue to eat fat, yes, every time they eat, they make insulin. And they make a lot more insulin than the people I just pointed out in this study. They are already at 60 microunits per milliliter of insulin when they start. When they eat, it goes up. They are overproducing insulin. They have a high level of this endocrine system already churning but it is a reduced amount from what they used to eat when they ate carbohydrates. And every time they put carbohydrates in their system, it just robs us and steps us back about two to three weeks when they binge on carbohydrates. Their insulin floods, they store up a bunch of the uh, glycogen storages that we were, were trying to empty, and we get this step back. So we don't want that. We want steady, slow progress in the right direction, which means 20 carbohydrates or less total carbohydrates. Get that under 20 and then stay the course for a good, I mean, I really think you can't get there, especially if they're overweight. You cannot get keto adapted in the hardiest way in under four weeks. I have not seen it. I mean, I can get healthy people adapted in shorter times than that, but when they're chronically inflamed, it's, you know, four weeks is the fastest they can do it. It's more like six weeks and they are eating high fat and they are keeping those carbs low and slowly what happens is some of the other endocrine hormones awaken. And they're like, doc, I am so stinking nauseated. I cannot, I can't eat as much as you're asking me to eat. And that's this little kind of bell in the back of my mind saying, oh, their ghrelin is uh, suppressing. Uh, their leptin is getting a little more efficient at how it uh, suppresses appetite. Some of the other fat-based hormones are in much stronger supply than they were several weeks ago. And that only happens when we lower insulin. It is at that point that we make a transition and then we do some of these other steps. If you want a full step-by-step -step on how I recommend uh, patients do this, you can sign up for the online class. Uh, that is, um, you know, you can peck around YouTube. It is, uh, you'll find many of the videos on YouTube. Nothing is as succinct with a lesson plan uh, built out as much as the online course. So help yourself to that if you're looking for the most efficient way to do a ketogenic diet. It is my hope that you share that course with a support group or a group of people that you're trying to help uh, teach about the ketogenic diet. I really do believe that we can reverse many of these medical problems, especially as the, the baby boomers take on one of the most dangerous uh, times in, in, in the history of, of America, but maybe the world, where um, their chronic illnesses are going to be their demise. Without a restoration of their immune systems and these fat-based hormones, without a restoration of their endocrine system, we are going to find a higher uh, higher pathology, higher morbidity and mortality from things like a virus that can sweep across this globe. So let's kind of turn this full back circle to Grandma Rose. So Grandma Rose is now 76. She is recently widowed, been through a rather stressful time, and um, she just got her labs back. Uh, her her cancer count is low, but there is there are three components built in your bone marrow. There are red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets in your bone marrow. Her white blood cells are pretty stable, and that's what her cancer has been growing. But the other two components, her red blood cells and her platelets, are on the low side. And the reason they're on the low side is almost always because of a scar tissue that's growing in her bone marrow. 
So you say, what do we do about that? Can we go in and scrape out her bone marrow and let it grow back? Can we give her a bone marrow transplant? The answer is no, no, no. She is 76. We're not doing any of that. But we can ask her body to uh, ignite autophagy. Now, Grandma Rose has been keto adapted for many uh, years now. She is five years into, uh, <clears throat> yeah, five years. Wow, congrats, Grandma, uh, into being keto adapted. She actually stayed keto all through the stress of my father's illness and death. And, and she's great. I mean, she is, again, healthier at 76 than she was at 56. Uh, she really has a gift um, that has been given to her in her health, and she is... Uh, appropriately thankful for it. But as we take on this slight complication to say, yep, uh, her bone marrow has some of that uh, debris or some scar tissue. Is there any way that we could recycle that? And how could we do that? Could we measure that? So uh, if you've been following the channel or following me on Instagram, I have, um, I've been, I, I document my numbers throughout uh, my journey. So whenever I fast is when I try to make sure I um, post my numbers on Dr. Ba's ratio. Um, again, it, was, um, it is something that I don't like fasting any more than anybody else, but I really find that when I am accountable to the patients that watch uh, online, but also the ones that attend my support group, when they see the physician does this too, it is a huge motivator for them. Uh, it's not just a punishment for somebody who's had ill health. I don't want cancer. I've got a dad who just died of kidney disease of some strange protein problem that we still never figured out by the time he died. Um, I have a mother who has cancer of her white blood cells. Um, and I don't want to have any of that. I want to have the healthiest cells replicating inside my body until the day I die. So how can I ensure that? I can make sure to touch autophagy, which gets back to the Dr. Boz ratio. If I can lower the Dr. Boz ratio to 80, I have a pretty good chance of hitting uh, autophagy. At the beginning of the show, you saw me hit a Dr. Boz ratio in, I think it was near 40 or maybe, it was near 50, that's what it was. As I look at my Dr. Boz ratio of 48, that's a, that's an okay predictor of uh, autophagy. If I could get it under 40, I'm pretty confident, like 70% chance that you are hitting autophagy. But if you get a Dr. Boz ratio of 20 or less, there is striking evidence that when that glucose is low and those ketones are high, it is a metabolic state that is very compatible with autophagy. Now, autophagy happens inside the cells. So I can't do a blood test to measure it in my mother. I can't do it, a blood test to measure it in my patients. Uh, and even if I could, it would be in research only. Um, what we're looking for is autophagy is when a cell has some wasted proteins. It has scar tissue somewhere, much like what Grandma Rose has in her bone marrow. And the scar tissue is filled with proteins that can be recycled. They get cut up into little amino acids and then they get reused in the system. More importantly, the junk or the debris is now cleaned out of the way. This is particularly important in the brain. When we look at Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or other chronic um, brain metabolism processes, multiple sclerosis, we know that there is an inflamed process that has left debris all over their brain. And to clean that up, we thought was impossible until we learned how autophagy works. And if we can spark autophagy, not once, not twice, but routinely over the course of a couple of years, we can see that those brain proteins are, are less. They are, they are swept up. That sweeping up process, that cleaning up process is autophagy. And it is predictable. Again, cannot measure it directly. It is only a prediction when you get that glucose low and the ketones high. So when you get a low Dr. Boz ratio, which is less than 20, you have a remarkable chance of recycling proteins within your system. So the uh, I have a, a, another fan out there who from Hawaii who gave me this idea, so I wanted to say thank you to Marlon, um, where he says, "What if we um, hit uh, 20 weeks of of uh, a Dr. Boss ratio of 20 in 2020?" 
So again, when I look at people asking to fast, I do not push them to a, a longer fast until they are keto adapted. The gal that came to the support group this past week who's frustrated that she hasn't lost as much weight, but she's only a few weeks into the ketogenic journey, I would not push her to do this. I would say you must stay the course. You've got to go through these steps that I go through in that course uh, and say once you get to the advanced levels of a ketogenic diet, once you get to the grandma rose level, then you can do a, a stimulus of your body to say, can you spark auto autophagy 20 weeks in a row by lowering your Dr. Boz ratio to 20 or less uh, for 20 weeks in a row? Now, I don't know if I'll make 20 weeks, but I have been over the, since my dad died, I've been doing a 72 hour fast. The 72 hour fast is hard. <laughs> is not fun, uh, but it does promote uh, a very advanced metabolism. It has been actually very helpful for me as I grieve for the death of my father and really kind of spend time reflecting in prayer. Uh, I use um, fasting and prayer very much like many people across the globe have used uh, fasting and prayer. But especially in this time where I'm grieving the loss of my dad, it's been very helpful. But instead of measuring these next 20 weeks with a timer, I've asked my mom, uh, Grandma Rose, to say, what if we did a Dr. Boz ratio of 20 or less each week? Uh, and maybe we won't get 20 weeks, but if we could set a goal of six weeks, of eight weeks. Um, she has uh, her oncology appointment on Tuesday. We already have the labs back. That's how we know these numbers. But she'll have another one in three months. So I said, out of those 12 weeks, if eight weeks out of the 12, you hit a Dr. Boz ratio of 20 or less, you are going to spark autophagy in your 76 year old body in a way that can really stop the progression of where you're headed for your cancer. And I push uh, this out to the world, not to show what my mom's struggling with today, but really to show you that there is a calculation behind the process of improving the human body. And that process uh, is measurable in a way that predicts autophagy. That is your Dr. Boz ratio. If you haven't downloaded the spreadsheet, help yourself. It is free. It is a powerful way to say, study yourself. Don't guess. Uh, and of course, I will be watching Grandma Rose and looking at her numbers and trying to fast along with her <laughs> long enough to spark my autophagy and my Dr. Boz ratio to 20 or less. All right, so I'm going to turn the... Uh, chat back on while I check my numbers and just take a look at what some of you have to say. First of all, thanks for sticking around. I know I got started a little bit late and then had a, a glitch in uh, one of the buttons I didn't push before starting. So uh, I like looking at your um, um, like looking at your questions. So if you have uh, Oh yeah, so somebody writes in, um, so it's, you wanna hit 20 or less in the morning or at any time during the day? Very good question. So I get this a lot, so I'm gonna take a little, a couple of minutes to explain that because the Dr. Boz ratio in the morning is the most accurate because there are less other variables in the way. So I, everybody says, but what about the dawn phenomenon? You know, when you wake up at you know, six o'clock in the morning, a couple hours ago, your body spiked cortisol and that released a bunch of glucose from your liver. I'm like, yep. And that happens exactly the same every day. Uh, the sun rises every day. That cortisol delivery is very predictable. It is more predictable than, did you have an infection? Have you had a fever? Are you stressed out? Did you sleep well? I mean, the kinds of things that uh, did you have a bowel movement? How, you know, three days of fasting can make you really crabby. <laughs> Are you crabby? So looking at the variables that change the Dr. Boz ratio, I contend that, um, and this is several patients, let me grab this. Uh, several patients have uh, tried to, uh, have been gracious in the number of data points they've kept to say, I'll prove to you that the one in the morning is the least variable. And that's what you're looking for. So Dr. Bell's ratio of 20 in the morning is, is pristine. I tell patients that if I can't get there by like 3.30 at the latest, four o'clock in the afternoon, um, I don't check, I don't like the numbers after that for sure. So for, first thing in the morning, very, very, very um, good job of improving uh, the doctor the the metabolism, which is really what you're you know studying this for, but the metabolism is best predicted by your Dr. Boz. Oops, yeah, I 
got two pink ones and not a, or two white ones and not a purple one. Mm. Try that again before this drips all over. Um, I do have, um, okay, so this is the glucose one and I will quickly put this up here. Here we go. And then this is the ketone one. Uh, again, you wanna wait for that little drip of blood to split that 275 is just the code that these specific ketone strips are set for. So uh, every, every one of your uh, meters comes with a little uh, thing. And so you can see that 275 is what this one is set for. So again, glucose is 80, <laughs> ketones are high, which means I just waited too long. Let me try again. All right, we're gonna do this again. Maybe I don't have to poke again. Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, so you can tell they work. <laughs> <laughs> the ketones were high, which is probably an error, but we will check it one more time. Somebody asked a really good question. Is, is Grandma Rose getting too skinny? Um, so let me answer that question too. All right, so 275, and then this is my ketone uh, countdown. And again, my glucose was 83. Uh, so is Grandma Rose too skinny? Nope, she's not too skinny. Uh, 5.8. So yeah, ketones in a can work. I didn't make all those. That is totally what a supplement does. And again, it suppresses appetite. It really does help people through, especially if they're insulin resistant. When I look at the folks really struggling with um, how do you keto adapt their system, and they have been overweight for 20 years. They have got a deadline to try and get this weight off or you know, or get to that knee surgery that they just can't seem to uh, to reach the goal that the surgeon wants them to be down so many pounds. Boy, ketones in a can has bridged them so amazingly. Again, they're not forever. They are meant to bridge the folks who are having the greatest trouble. Um, somebody asked, can I have a copy of the spreadsheet? If you go to the show notes below, you will be able to click on uh, Dr. Boss spreadsheet. Any of the uh, YouTube videos over the last... Um, I don't know, year and a half, <laughs> I have that link in it. If you go to bozmd.com and scroll down about two thirds away down the um, page, you can find a link that says, if you want the spreadsheet, you can download it. Um, and again, it does the calculations for you. I import a uh, set into uh, Google Sheets, which is their Excel version and have, oh, thank you, Bethany. That Dr. Ball's ratio was 14.3. That um, I wouldn't count if I was, trying to get to a Dr. Foss ratio of 20. That is a supplemented number, so I wouldn't count that, but uh, it is powerful to say what happens when you supplement ketones. Uh, you can uh, really stimulate your metabolism, suppress that appetite, and do an amazing uh, improvement. So let's get back to Grandma Rose being skinny. Is Grandma Rose too skinny? Um, no, she's not too skinny. So you look at her her cross to bear. She, she was overweight by 30 maybe 40 pounds for 25, 30 years. During that time, she had cancer growing in her system. Whether or not she knew it was there or not, we knew about it for the 10 years before age 71. So from 61 to 71, we knew about it. Um, and to know that, I, I get this question a lot, Dr. Bosworth, I wanna go on the ketogenic diet, but I don't wanna lose weight. And again, I do not have them focus on the weight, especially until they're keto adapted. Grandma Rose will be able to calculate very specifically whether or not she is gaining or losing weight. Um, when ketones are high, especially 5.8, that is an incredible protection for her to break down muscle tissue. Uh, the higher levels of a ketone don't just give my body energy. They don't just improve the brain function and suppress appetite. They signal a protective process that say, do not break down muscle. We want only to be burning fat at this point when those ketones are that high. So being in a ketogenic state, being in a state of, um, you know, ketogenic diet isn't what you eat, it is what's your chemistry, what is your blood numbers. And Grandma Rose can have confidence that she will have um, the power of ketones protecting her muscles from breaking down, because we do not want her losing muscle. And if she's, as long as she's in ketosis and she's measuring the Dr. Boz ratio, she can see those ketones rising and the glucose going down. She can confidently know that being on the ketogenic diet is improving her, her system, improving autophagy, hopefully giving more space in her bone marrow for the white blood cell or for the red blood cells and the platelets to grow. Um, and she can be really confident in that uh, because of her Dr. Boz ratio. If she is not measuring if she is just holding back calories 
or if the gal who came to the keto group this past week who wants to lose weight, if she jumps over and just says, I'm not going to listen to that doctor, I'm just going to fast like everybody else, I'm a strong woman, I can do this, and I can smell my own kind, I can see that thinking happening. But if she does that, she does not have the power to raise those ketones as powerfully as Grandma Rose or somebody who is keto adapted. And when people say, I'm so scared of losing weight, right, the weight we're talking about is muscle loss. We do not want you losing muscle weight. I do not want my mother losing muscle weight. What I do want is I want autophagy stimulated. I want her to break down those debris proteins, that scar t tissue within her bone marrow, and I know she can do that if she's following the Dr. Bow's ratio. So those are very good questions. Um, all right, somebody asked about ketones in the can in Canada. I saw that. I'm like, I am trying. Uh, as many of you know, there was a, from coronavirus to the debacle that happened at the beginning of January. I am finally back up on Amazon and we are applying to uh, send uh, products to Canada, to the UK, and to um, to Australia, but holy moly, uh, it's a lot of paperwork. <laughs> You'd think it was an insurance company. <laughs> it's just Amazon. But we are um, uh, improving that. Uh, we're working on it. That's all I can tell you. I guess I'm, I am trying to get that done. So uh, one last question. Lori asks about autophagy and lipoma fats. So lipomas are little fatty tumors. And again, there's a signal that makes those fatty tumors. If you look at what that signal is, the number one signal that made that fatty tumor appear in the first place was insulin. So this is a perfect question for this talk specifically because we just showed you those healthy patients that were young, they were fit, they were young. I mean, they were not on a diet. They just said, I feel healthy and my body mass index is normal. Look at how much insulin they made. Insulin is a growth factor. It makes things grow. It makes skin tags grow. It makes moles grow. It makes hair grow in the wrong places and some hair on the top of your head not grow. It makes uh, debris grow. It is a growth hormone. And one of the things it stimulates is the production of fatty tumors. So to get a fatty tumor to go away, you must lower insulin. If you want those fatty lipomas to reabsorb, you've got to get your Dr. Boz ratio down. That means keto adapt first. I wouldn't buy a blood kit for six weeks. Once you're truly feeling the spirit of the, uh, uh, of the ketogenic chemistry, then you can invest in a, in, a, in a blood meter. And if you want the specific steps on it, I will I tell you that online course, it is uh, in the show notes be below. It is the best tool. It is what my book is based on, but at this rate, I hope my book is out by Thanksgiving. <laughs> I am done with my part of the writing, or at least most of my part of the writing. And uh, once a husband has read it, then I will give it out to some pre-readers and we will get that on the market as um, a much more economical way for you to learn this information that is in that online course. All right, I've gone way over time. So I appreciate those of you that have stuck around uh, and I will see you next week. Uh, we are the Dr. Boss Show, improving your health one ketone at a time. See everybody.